So, allopatric speciation. You may be asking yourself, is there evidence for allopatric speciation? And the answer is, yes, there is evidence uh, that allopatric speciation occurs, uh, both experimentally in the laboratory, uh, as well as from observational studies in nature. So, uh, for the first case, uh, an experiment was performed using a... Um, a type of fruit fly, Drosophila pseudo-obscura, closely related to Drosophila melanogaster, the famous uh, fruit fly studied by Thomas Hunt Morgan. Uh, so these fruit flies uh, came from an initial population and then they were separated. Some flies were raised on a starch medium for them to eat and others were raised on a maltose medium which was their source of nutrition. And then a year later, uh, the progeny from these many generations, about 40 generations, um, were brought together and uh, attempts to allow them to mate were uh, done. And here are the results. Uh, so when you had females and males that were raised on starch, they were much more likely to attempt to mate with each other than if they were mating uh, than with a fly from the other medium. So starch males wanted to mate with starch females and maltose males wanted to mate with maltose females but uh, mating against their food uh, stuff was not favored. Whereas in a controlled population, uh, the results were more or less equal. It didn't matter what the, uh, the uh, fly was raised on in this controlled population. The distribution of the matings were about equal, suggesting that uh, these flies were developing a preference, which over more generations would eventually lead to a reproductive barrier, uh, a prezygotic barrier in terms of habitat isolation. Uh, but we also observe allopatric speciation under natural circumstances, and this is a great example uh, with species of the snapping shrimp in the genus Alpheus uh, that are separated by the Isthmus of Panama. So we've got 30 species that are arranged in 15 pairs. Uh, and these 15 pairs are actually across the Isthmus of Panama, which uh, geologists tell us originated between 9 and 13 million years ago. So before this uh, Isthmus of Panama was there, the Atlantic floated in the Pacific. Uh, actually, I think it was the other way around. Anyway, um, and these 15 pairs of species were just 15 species of snapping shrimp. Okay, so for simplicity's sake, there's only two pairs of species depicted here. So you've got uh, Alpheus formosus and Alpheus nuttingi, which are on the Atlantic side of the Isthmus of Panama, uh, Alpheus panamensis and Alpheus milzi which are on the Pacific side of the Isthmus of Panama. And uh, you might think, um, without prior knowledge of how this Isthmus was formed, that it's more likely that these species share uh, more recent common ancestry, and these species share more recent common ancestry. But through looking at morphological, as well as uh, genetic data, looking at DNA sequence data, we know that Alpheus formosus and Alpheus panamensis share a more recent common ancestor, and Alpheus nuttingi and Alpheus milzi share a more recent common ancestor. So these are sister species, and these are sister species. So uh, just put a little diagram here to depict what's going on here. So here's South America. Uh, here is the Central American Peninsula, back when that's what it was, uh, and they were 20 million years ago. And through time, uh, through accretion of sediments, this seaway here closed up. And the snapping 
shrimp were trapped on either side of this uh, developing isthmus, and uh, this has led to allopatric speciation. So they're no longer reproductively uh, compatible. And as a matter of fact, we can even look at the DNA evidence and see that uh, Alpheus Nuttingai and Alpheus Milzii here at the southern end, or actually the eastern end of the isthmus, share more recent common ancestry than species found more in the western end of the isthmus, which is congruent with the idea from geology that the isthmus uh, uh, accumulated from west to east. So these have been separated for longer, therefore they've been reproductively isolated for longer, and the DNA sequences are more divergent. They have uh, fewer nucleotides in common. And this is true for the uh, 15 pairs of species along this isthmus of Panama. And it also extends further to species that are found uh, in deeper water versus shallower water. Uh, so we find that regions that have a lot of geographic barriers are typically more speciose. Uh, since there are a lot more uh, geographic barriers, since there's a lot more geographic diversity, we do find that there's going to be an increase in biodiversity and the number of species that are present. Uh, and that makes sense because uh, geographic barriers uh, are one of the things that drive speciation and drive reproductive isolation. Also, we see that reproductive isolation between populations is going to increase as the distance between them increases. Uh, so, these reproductive barriers are something that develops within the species. It's not just the physical spe separation, uh, it's what happens with the biology of the organism through time. We can't just separate two populations for a period of time um, and assume that they're going to become reproductively isolated uh, just because of the physical separation. What happens to affect that, that uh, reproductive barrier is more a result of uh, an indirect result of the physical separation, not a direct result. Sympatric speciation uh, is what occurs when we have populations that are geographically in the same area. Uh, and because populations occurring in the same area have uh, more potential for gene flow, uh, it's much less frequent that we have cases of true sympatric speciation. Uh, but it does happen. It can happen. It does happen. Uh, here are a couple of factors that can direct that. Uh, polyploidy, which, as we've mentioned before, uh, is much more frequent in plants. Uh, sexual selection is another uh, uh, driver of sympatric speciation. And within a habitat, uh, within an area, you can have overlapping species, but then maybe something at the finer scale uh, makes it... Uh, makes their develop some reproductive barrier, like habitat differentiation, okay? So, we know that polyploidy is when we get extra sets of chromosomes. It occurs uh, during meiosis. Much, much more frequent in plants than in animals. We know that it happens uh, more frequently than not in plants. And what this means is, effectively, in one generation you can have a new species in one generation, just like that. The switch goes on and new species. So polyploidy can occur in a couple of ways. We can further say that there are uh, autopolyploids uh, and there are allopolyploids. So autopolyploids might have two more than two chromosome sets, uh, but they come from within the same species. So it's like they have the entire genome replicated. Um, but you can also have the case where, okay, well, here's autopolyploidy first. Uh, due to some error in cell division, maybe we end up with a tetraploid cell that can undergo meiosis. Uh, the 
gametes from these tetraploids can fuse, and boom. Here we've got a new species uh, with a haploid number of six, whereas the parent had a haploid number of three. So 2n equals six, n equals three. Here, n equals six. So basically, the entire genome, every chromosome, is duplicated. Uh, an allopolyploid occurs when uh, sets of chromosomes come from different species. So allo, remember, it's kind of like allopatry means different. An uh, autopolyploid has uh, replicated uh, replications of the same chromosomes. Allopolyploids have uh, replicated chromosomes from different species. Okay, so we're here we have two species. Uh, here's species A with a diploid number of six, species B with a diploid number of four. Uh, they can produce their gametes with three or two chromosomes respectively. And they form a hybrid with five chromosomes. Uh, and then through some type of error, uh, we double the chromosome number, and now our diploid number for this cell is 10. Okay, but we've got two different parents that are contributing, uh, parents of two different species, uh, that somehow the uh, prezygotic barriers not present, uh, and the postzygotic barriers not great enough to prevent uh, this organism from forming. And this has been documented uh, in several cases, at least five that we know of, uh, since the first one was found in 1850. So uh, the genus Tragopogon, which is closely related to uh, dandelions and chicory and lettuce and a number of other uh, familiar plants, uh, we know uh, that we've got at least two allopolyploid species that have been derived from three diploid parents. Okay? Uh, in addition, we know that a number of our most important uh, commodities, crops like oats, cotton, potatoes, tobacco, wheat, are polyploids. And you know this from our uh, laboratory where we extract the DNA from the strawberries. You know that uh, our commercial strawberries are actually octoploid. So they actually have eight sets of uh, duplicated chromosomes. Uh, in the case of Tragopogon, uh, here are three species of Tragopogon. Two of the yellow forms and one purple form. Uh, Tragopogon pretensis, Tragopogon dubius, uh, and Tragopogon porifolius. And here are their... Um, they're diploid numbers, so Tragopogon dubius has 12 chromosomes, as does Pretensis and Porifolius. And we find that there are at least two of these haploid, uh, sorry, polyploid species uh, that have been named Tragopogon miscellus and Tragopogon miris, uh, which have more than the 12 chromosomes that either of the parent species had. Uh, so another thing that can drive sympatric speciation is sexual selection. So if uh, a species, uh, a subset of a species directs its mating such that it's only going to mate with certain members of a population, uh, through time that can lead to reproductive barriers that extend uh, beyond just uh, through mate choice but can lead to an inability for those uh, members of that population to reproduce uh, with other populations in the same habitat. Uh, and we know this is true for uh, cichlid fish in Lake Victoria. Okay, I'm going to pause here, a little break, and we'll come back.